let's get started with bubble sort. So sorting algorithms are one of the more common domains, as it says here. Uh, you'll often at BS to implement a sorting algorithm as part of a test. That happens quite a bit. Bubble sort is not the most efficient way of doing it, but it is kind of one of the classics. And as it says here, it, sort, it, sorts by, it works by comparing and possibly swapping two values in a set. So the example they have here, you start at 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5. It checks, is 1 greater than 0? That means it's out of order, so you swap them around. And the reason it's called a bubble sort is you keep on doing this until the largest values bubble to the surface. I actually have a uh, visualization video here. Let's see, how, let's see if this looks good. OK, let's. Hmm. All right, maybe we get to here. Hmm. I'm not a big fan of that one. That's a little too fancy. I just want to see the bubble sort. Oh, God, I hate that sound. There we go. So, OK, now that it's muted, we can see each, you know, kind of each uh, value bubbles up to the surface like so, so on and so on. It's going, going ahead a little bit. There we go. So not the most efficient algorithm, but it will get the job done. So taking a look at their richer example, so they have pre-sequence 4, 3, uh, 0, 1. Uh, the previous value that we're uh, doing, so 4, is greater than 3. So we, yes, we do swap them, swap them. And then we go on to the next, and then it says we start over again in this version. 3 is not greater than 4, so we don't swap. 4 is not greater than 5, so we do swap. 5 is greater than 0, sorry, 5 is 4 and 5, 4 is not greater than 5, so we don't swap. 5 is greater than 0, so we do swap. So 3, 4, 5, 0, 1 becomes 3, 4, 0, 5, 1. Keeps on repeating until that goes on. So as you can see, we have two releases for this. So one is implementation. So the idea up here is that you can see every time we swapped, we start out over again. But let's take a look at the release two, full collection passes. So this is the version of bubble sort describes above is actually a slightly simplified version of the algorithm, which uses a short circuiting approach. So as soon as the number is swapped, go back to the beginning of the list and try again. But the real algorithm, every pass should e actually iterate completely through the list and then decide whether another pass is needed. So I'm going to just go straight ahead to release two to do the full collection passes here. Going to clone it. I'm going to do this one in Python, since we did the last one in JavaScript. And so we can see here it's asked us to print results and the number, total number of swaps that we're going to be doing. Uh, this time, I'm going to hold off on actually implementing undoing unit tests just because I want to get straight to the good stuff right now. So I'm going to make sure I just define bubble sort that takes in an array. And I'm just going to say, instead of that, I'm going to say print bubble sort with sequence. And then we'll worry about swaps later. OK, now let's start pseudocoding here. So we know that we need to iterate. We're going to have to define this function, define bubble sort. That takes an array as an argument. All right. And we know we're going to have to loop through this. We're going to have to loop through this a certain number of time. We're going to have to iterate through the entire array a certain number of times until it's done. And so 
let me see if I can put my thinking here into words, words well. So I'm going to kind of go up here and do a separate thing. I'm going to copy this example they have. So here's this. And my goal is at the end of the first pass, when I go through the entire thing, I want five to already be in its correct spot. So what I'd want to do is I'd say, OK, go through the entire thing. If a swap is necessary, swap. So my sequence would kind of, of one pass would look kind of like this. So that's one. Then we'd swap three and four. And then five, zero, and one would remain the same. And then we'd just keep checking. Four and five need to remain the same. So it would look exactly the same. Because, yeah, these are in the right place as far as it knows. Then we check five and zero. And since those do need to be swapped, it would look like this three, four, 0, 5, 1. In the next one, we need to swap again because 5 is greater than 1. So 3, 4, 0, uh, 1, 5. So that's one pass through this sequence. And we can see 5 ends up where it needs to be. That's why it's like a bubble sort. Once we get to find the largest value, it'll bubble up to its correct position. And then we do it again. I would expect four to end up where one is now. Is that making sense so far? And logically, if every time I go through this uh, sequence, the next largest value ends up in the correct place, how many times would I ideally need to repeat the entire repeat this loop? if my sequence has five values in it. Five times, right? Yeah. Yeah, the number of times. Mm -hmm. So how about I say, create something called counter. And I'll set that equal to length of array. And then I'll set up a while loop. I'll say while counter is greater than zero. I want to iterate through array. And then for each of these characters, I want to say, or if values, so set like previous equals, I guess it would be array i, and current equals array i plus 1. And then we'd have if previous is greater than current, swap previous and current. And we just keep on doing that. And then at the end of every iteration, counter minus equals 1. And so the idea is we just keep on doing this, you know, swap, 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 decrease the counter, do it again, until we've done this a number of times equal to the length of the array. Any questions about how this is going to work? Let's try it out. So I'll say counter equals len of array. Then I'll say while counter is greater than zero. Then I'm going to say for, in this case, we'd want to, we want to make sure we're iterating through the indexes of the array, not through the not through the values, because the uh, because the indexes here are, going to, are important. So I'm going to say for index in range, len of array, whoops, I'm 
All right, so first I need to make sure I need to compare the previous one with the current one. Make sure I'm like, yep, so we have previous and current at the first and second position. So I'd say previous equals array i, current equals array i plus one. Should be index, right? That's what you. Yes, you're right. Thank you. All right. So first stuff, I'm just going to say I just want to print out previous and current, making sure everything's working correctly, and, and to make sure this loop doesn't this loop ends, we want to make sure we do counter minus equals one. So now if I open this up and then run it. Uh oh, we have a problem. List index out of range. So what happened here? Because we printed out four and three, three and five, five and zero, zero and one. So we get to here and everything works fine. Then we get to here and then what happens? Your index plus one is out of the range of the list. So we got to make sure that we don't accidentally uh, go out of range of the array. And to fix that, we can just say, OK, what we're going to be looping through isn't the range, the length of the array. It will be the length of the array minus 1. So now if I do it, it loops through it a whole bunch of times and prints out everything, but doesn't change the order yet. So that looks pretty good. Now we need to swap them. And so we can say if previous is greater than current. So how do we swap these guys around? Create a temp variable. Yep. We make a variable called temp. And we can set that to one of our variables. It doesn't really matter which one, so long as we're holding on to one of them. So let's say temp equals current. Then I can say, array index plus one equals previous and array index equals temp. Seeing something in the chat. Oh, so we could do multiple assignment variables, do previous current equals current previous. Hmm, nice. Let's try that. That's one of those things that logically I'm like, oh yeah, of course that should work, but I hadn't thought of it. And so if I just do print array right here, let's see if it swaps things around. Um, this, the assignment, instead of previous, you want to say array oh, of index. You're right. Because you're, you're just right. changing reference. Yep. yep. Index, index and array index plus one. Oh, hey, look at that. That looks pretty sorted to me. So at the end, we just need to, instead of printing the array, we got to make sure that we return the array. So 0, 1, 3, 4, 5. That looks pretty good. Oh, we haven't been keeping track of how many swaps we've done. So we want to make sure that every time we swap, we also say, swaps plus equals one. Let's try that. Uh-oh. Local variable swaps is referenced before assignment. Well, that's interesting. We defined swaps up here. What's the problem? So this is kind of getting into what our lecture topic for today is. Yeah, that swap is in a different scope. It's in the global scope and the one yeah. you want function scope. So you have to declare um, and initialize swaps within the function and it will shadow the global one. Yeah, exactly. So one thing that's an important to understand about any coding language is scope. And the idea is when we define something out here, 
a function is its own different kind of location, and it doesn't necessarily have access to this. So we could define another variable called swaps here. We, if we wanted to, and this isn't really good practice, but it will work. If we wanted to say, hey, I want to give this function access to, uh, to swaps, I could do this, global swaps. And that's just saying, hey, check the global scope, meaning everything for a variable called swaps and have access to it. So now if I run it, it keeps track of how many swaps I have because we've had seven swaps. So that global keyword allows a function to reach outside of its own scope and grab something from the you know, larger thing. I wouldn't recommend that as a general practice. Uh, keeping track, uh, essentially global variables are a recipe for trouble. So we could also, if you wanted to, probably an easier way to do that would be something like this. Get rid of that and say swaps equals zero. And then instead of having down here print this, I would just make it part of the function. And that makes my code a little, little more clean, a little more uh, safe as well. Because now swaps is only defined within bubble sort. Check the chat. All right, so let's try, let's try this out with a few different combinations of this just to make sure. So I could do sequence two, make this one like five, four, zero, one, three, and make another one equal like zero, Three, one, five, four. So I should get the same answer for all of, for sequence two and sequence three. That looks good. And sequence three. That one worked, and we only needed two swaps that time. All right, what questions do you have about bubble sort? Mm -hmm. Again, like bubble sort isn't something you would necessarily want to use in your day-to-day -day life. It's not the most efficient way of sorting an array. There are many more efficient ways on, out there, but bubble sort is a very common algorithm, and this is a pretty simple way to implement it. And I think I may have set a little bit of a record of going through this function, going through this challenge. So let's see here. How about we take just a quick five minute break, be back here at 946, and then we'll get into our lecture topic for the day and then end, end the morning pretty early.